9. RMS Royal Oak During World War I, HMS Royal Oak was one of the five Revenge-class battleships built for the Royal Navy. Completed in 1916, the ship first saw action as part of the Grand Fleet at the Battle of Jutland. During peacetime, she operated in the Atlantic, home and Mediterranean fleets, and was attacked numerous times. Royal Oak received international notice in 1928 when her top commanders were controversially court-martialed, causing significant humiliation to what was then the world's greatest fleet. Attempts to modernize Royal Oak throughout the course of her 25-year career were futile, and by the onset of World War II, she was no longer fit for frontline duty. The ship was anchored in Scarpa Flow in Orkney, Scotland in October in 1939 when she was sunk by the German submarine U-47. 835 of Royal Oak's 1,234 men and youths were killed that night, or died later from their wounds. The loss of the ancient ship, the first of five Royal Navy battleships and battlecruisers destroyed during World War II, had minimal effect on the British Navy's and its allies' numerical supremacy, but it had a significant impact on wartime morale. Ten divers from the Royal Navy's Northern Diving Group, based in Faslane, lifted the flag in the spooky underwater stillness before attaching it to an upper prop shaft and honoring the deceased in a solemn ceremony. The horrific image of HMS Royal Oak was generated 12 years ago electronically by combining a collection of images and video footage. The only way to see the disaster through the muddy seas is a single image. Even on the brightest days, vision is limited to around 50 feet 15 meters. On poor days, it's almost non-existent. The wreck has been classified as a war grave, and under the Protection of Military Remains Act of 1986, all diving or other illegal types of investigation are forbidden. 8. Tugboat Graveyard Located in the ports of New York and New Jersey, like some of history's most cherished vessels, Arthur Kill is a graveyard where old ferries, barges, and tugboats are brought and left behind. John J. Witt, the reason behind the collection, insisted that they remain and not be dismantled. It stayed that way right up until his passing in 1980. After his death, it was handed down to his son-in-law, Joe Coyne, and then it was passed down to Joe's son, Arnold. Throughout John's days, as many as 400 relics could be found in his collection, but that number since dropped to 200. The Arthur Kill is home to NYC's Fire Deputy Abram S. Hewitt, who assisted in the attempt to rescue passengers from the paddle steamer P.S. General Slocum, which caught fire and sank during a fatal trip to Long Island that resulted in over a thousand deaths. A D-Day boat, the New England Passenger Steamer, is also amongst the relics after having had a long career. And then there's the Eldia, a steel freighter that was 469 feet, 143 meters long, and was blown ashore on March 29, 1984. The owner had planned on fixing it, but ran out of funds and it was later scrapped instead. Today, Arthur Kill holds some of the most cherished and memorable relics to date. Everyone from marine historians, artists, photographers, documentary makers, and even urban explorers come to see Arthur Kill. Despite it being hard to get to and out of reach, they often use boats or kayaks to paddle alongside the relics to do some deeper exploring. Part of the movie can be seen in the movie Salt, starring Angelina Jolie. A 32-minute documentary was made on it called Graves of Arthur Kill in 2012. This place has gained such immense popularity over the years that there's an Instagram page dedicated to posting the best pictures people send in. 7. The Great Blue Hole The Caribbean Sea submerged a series of gigantic tunnels more than 10,000 years ago as a result of rising seas at the conclusion of the last Big Ice Age. The Belize Blue Hole, a nearly perfectly round stretch of blue water, approximately 980 feet 300 meters wide and 410 feet 125 meters deep, was formed by geological causes. It's located in the heart of Lighthouse Reef, an offshore atoll 60 miles 96.5 kilometers from Belize City. In the 1970s, French marine biologist Jacques Cousteau listed it among the top 10 diving locations in the world. The Belize Blue Hole draws divers from all over the world because of the incredible experience of exploring giant underwater stalactites and stalagmites, some reaching up to 40 feet or 12 meters in length, and surreal, gorgeous tunnels at its depth. Due to the difficulty of the diving anticipated, only experienced divers with a minimum of 24 completed dives are permitted to enter. Sharks inhabit the Blue Hole, including bull sharks, Caribbean reef sharks, and the rare hammerhead shark. It's one of the seven wonders of Belize's World Heritage Site, and National Geographic has listed it as number one on the list of 10 most amazing places on Earth, and it's even visible from space. Let us know in the comments if you dive here. Don't forget to subscribe before the end of the video. 
6. Chuuk Lagoon The Chuuk Lagoon facility in the South Pacific was destroyed by America during Operation Hailstone on February 17th and 18th. Japan lost almost 250 planes and 137 tons of ships, the ruins of which may still be found at the lagoon's bottom, the world's largest ship and aircraft cemetery. All of the ships discovered are considered Japanese war graves. The event is frequently referred to as the Japanese counterpart of the attack on Pearl Harbor. Chuuk Lagoon is now regarded as one of the best wreck diving locations in the world. Chuuk Lagoon, formerly Truck Atoll, is located 1,800 kilometers and consists of a barrier reef encircling a natural harbor. The nearby Chuuk Islands had been inhabited since the 14th century AD, but were claimed by the Spanish Empire, the German Empire, and finally the Empire of Japan in 1914, when it took the lagoon from Germany during World War I. A U.S. naval strike on the Japanese Imperial Naval Facility at Chuuk in 1944 destroyed it. The Japanese withdrew their bigger battleships after being warned. However, the onslaught known as Operation Hailstone lasted three days, with U.S. bombers sinking 12 smaller warships and 32 commercial ships, as well as 275 aircraft. The destruction of Chuuk Lagoon's base stopped it from posing a significant danger to the Allies in the Central Pacific, especially after it was struck again in June 1945 by British naval troops. 25 years later, Jacques Cousteau, William A. Brown, and their crew visited Chuuk Lagoon. In 1971, Cousteau broadcast a television program explaining his discoveries, capturing the attention of divers all over the world. Chuuk saw the establishment of the first scuba diving company in 1973, and since then, both scuba divers and snorkelers have been blowing bubbles in the South Pacific seas. The wrecks of Chuuk Lagoon are continually being discovered, but what distinguishes them from other wrecks is the presence of submarines, battleships, airplanes, motorbikes, train wagons, and a variety of weaponry. Divers willing to undertake the lengthy journey to Chuuk Lagoon will unearth a variety of ridges, including machine gun ammo, medical supplies, aircraft engines, vehicles, deck guns, torpedoes, and submarine periscopes. Today, visitors to the Chuuk Lagoon may scuba dive among the magnificent preserved relics of the Japanese Imperial Navy fleet. Divers can spend hours examining the site's wrecks, returning numerous times without encountering the same wreckage twice, bearing witness to Operation Hailstone's massive damage. 5. Ramu Underwater Prison Ramu is a tiny town in northern Estonia, about 28 miles 45 kilometers from Tallinn. While few people have heard of the location, it has a hidden treasure for divers, an underwater jail in Estonia. Quarrying at Ramu began in 1938, with convicts from Ramu Prison, previously known as Muru, mining limestone and marble and living in a prison camp in the quarry. Following Estonia's independence from the Soviet Union in 1991, the government disbanded the camp and abandoned the property. The mine drained groundwater out of the quarry and into the surrounding town for use in fields when it was in operation. However, once it was abandoned, the quarry floor began to flood once more, bringing with it the jail structures that had held prisoners. Today, the quarry bottom is home to an underwater metropolis, making it a popular diving location. The surviving structures are now deteriorated and covered with graffiti. The spectacular limestone dunes and the pure blue ocean, on the other hand, are simply stunning. 4. Lake Reshen Bell Tower There were once three lakes, Lake Reshen, the Curon, and San Valentino Alamuta. They were linked by a dam in 1950, which tragically flooded Ground Village, its buildings, and its grounds. Residents were forced to flee, and just the 14th century church tower survived in the village. It appears out of nowhere, and it transforms Lake Reshen into a wonderfully attractive and fantastic spot, a symbol of the entire valley. When the lake freezes over in the winter, the bell tower may be reached on foot. Development for a lesser artificial lake began in 1920, but a new concept for a considerably larger and deeper lake was submitted in 1939. The newest design would combine two natural lakes, but it would submerge several settlements. Construction on the newer lake began in 1940, but due to local opposition and the progress of the Second World War, it was not finished for another decade at least until 1950. The Edison Energy Company improved on the 1920 proposal for an artificial lake in July 1939. This newer concept was intended for a depth of 72 feet 22 meters by combining two existing natural lakes, Russian Sea and Mitter Sea. The idea would allow for the building of a dam to deliver power to the region by constructing this artificial lake. Unfortunately, this would drown several existing communities, including Graun, Russian, Arlung, Piz, and Stokkerhoff. 
Almost a decade later, despite fierce opposition from the locals, the corporation got funds for the construction of a dam that would aid in the formation of the lake. Over 150 homes were damaged, and over 1,200 acres of land had to be drowned in order to build this lake. At the bottom of the lake is a full village and town, complete with roads, stores, and schools. The water was also not deep enough to sink the church tower, so it's the only building visible above the surface. Local legend has it that the tower's bells can still be heard ringing. These bells are reported to be heard during the darkest hours and the harshest winters. This is unsettling because the tower's bells were dismantled about 70 years ago when building on the lake began. 3. SS City of Adelaide The SS City of Adelaide, launched in 1863 from Glasgow, Scotland, initially shuttled people between Sydney, Melbourne, and Honolulu. The ship was refurbished and converted into a sailing vessel after approximately 30 years. That's when the issues began. First, the boat stopped ferrying passengers and began storing coal and other goods. It caught fire in 1912 and burned for many days before being extinguished. The ship was then bought three years later by George Butler, a magnetic island resident who thought he might use it as a barrier for a dock in Picnic Bay. Unfortunately, the SS city of Adelaide went ashore at Cockle Bay while being towed to its destination. It remains there to this day, and its state has deteriorated over the decades. The SS city of Adelaide's woes only worsened over time. During World War II, one of the towering masts brought down a bomber during a training exercise, making the ruin dangerous. The crash killed three members of the Royal Australian Air Force and one member of the United States Navy. Then, in the 1970s, a storm struck nearby, partially collapsing the ship's iron hull. The ship's wreckage is now home to a flourishing forest of marshes. The trees, adapted to life in hard conditions, have made themselves at home amid the submerged ruins of the ship. Interestingly, while the SS city of Adelaide was in service for nearly a century, the marshes are fairly recent. 2. RMS Titanic The RMS Titanic was the biggest moving thing in the world when it set sail on April 10, 1912. Modern cruise ships would surpass the Titanic's 882-foot, 269-meter length, but at the time, the world marveled at its size. Even now, it remains one of history's most famous ships. The massive ship was marketed as being unsinkable, but the world knows how that turned out. On its inaugural voyage, it collided with an iceberg, and its safety devices were unable to withstand the flood of water that flowed into the ship. The Titanic sank in the chilly Atlantic seas south of Newfoundland less than three hours later. Over 1,500 of the 2,224 people on board were killed. Numerous plans for raising the sinking ship were made, but none seemed feasible. The Titanic went down in the water 12,000 feet, and no one knew where it was. In 1985, a Franco-American team discovered the wreck. Until then, explorers assumed the ship had sunk intact. Surprisingly, it was discovered in two parts on the ocean floor, 0.3 miles. Both parts had smashed against the bottom, crumpling the bow and causing the stern to fall altogether. However, parts of the ship's interior were discovered relatively undamaged, and the field of debris between the two sections is littered with thousands of items, furniture, dining ware, and personal things such as jewelry and toys, as well as the shoes of victims whose remains and clothing were devoured by marine critters and germs litter the bottom. Many of these objects have been discovered and repaired for display, but the ship itself is unlikely to be taken to the surface. The Titanic's health has deteriorated significantly since its finding, and most experts believe it will never be raised. Many people have also stated that doing so would be unethical, because it would mean meddling with the last resting places of hundreds of victims. 1. Underwater Forest an enormous 60,000-year-old cypress forest formerly stood on dry ground in the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Alabama. The trees arose along the banks of a river at the same time as prehistoric humans are thought to have begun migrating out of Africa. Sediment covered old, fallen trees, and water levels progressively rose, covering the entire forest, which remained undisturbed until 2004, when Hurricane Ivan disturbed the seabed, revealing its presence in Mobile Bay. Scientists stated earlier this year that the trees may contain ingredients that might lead to the creation of life-saving drugs. Divers recovered samples of the wood in December 2019 as part of a National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration NOAA, funded mission. The trees were amazingly well-preserved despite being covered in mud for years, preventing oxygen from reaching them and causing deforestation. 
Over 300 organisms were extracted from the wood, including a previously unknown shipworm species that generated over 100 varieties of bacteria, many of which are new to science and are undergoing DNA analysis to identify their potential medical benefits as anti-cancer and pain medications. According to a NOAA announcement on the finds, at least one shipworm-related bacterium has previously shown potential as an antibiotic against parasitic worm illnesses. Researchers are also looking into the wood's potential usage in paper goods, renewable fuels, chemicals, animal feeds, and other purposes. 9. Mm Alish Satellite Dish In the early morning hours of August 2, 1990, Iraqi forces invaded the neighboring country of Kuwait under orders from Saddam Hussein. They quickly overwhelmed Kuwait's armed forces, prompting many to retreat to Saudi Arabia. The emir, his family, and other high-ranking government members also fled, and within a few short hours, Iraq had taken control of Kuwait City, giving the country de facto control over 20% of the world's oil reserves. The United Nations responded quickly by demanding an immediate withdrawal and banning its members from trading with Iraq, which included gas sales. But the conflict persisted and is remembered today as the Persian Gulf War. The United States got involved and forced Iraq's military out of Kuwait, and the war officially ended several weeks later under the terms of a UN resolution. Evidence of the destruction remained visible for nearly 20 years in the form of a destroyed telecommunication hub outside Kuwait City, near the Iraqi border. Known as the Umm al i satellite dishes, the two burned-out structures had once facilitated telephone and wireless correspondence for ships, planes, and the military. They stood as an unofficial monument to the country's struggle against its invading neighbor until 2009, when the Kuwait government dismantled them and sold them for scrap. 8. Quigley's Castle In 1919, a young Italian girl named Elise Fiora Vanti moved to Eureka Springs, Arkansas, which is located in the scenic Ozark Mountains. During the Great Depression, when she was 18 years old, she married a man named Albert Quigley. They lived together in a shack at Quigley's farm and lumber mill, where they had five children together. Albert always promised Elise that he would someday build her a house using timber that was felled on their property. But it didn't happen as quickly as Elise wanted it to, so one day in 1943, she took matters into her own hands. After Albert left for work, she instructed her children to help tear the family shack down, leaving her husband with no choice but to rebuild according to her wishes. Elise wanted a spacious home with 28 large windows, but materials were scarce because World War II was going on at the time. But construction proceeded anyway, and the finished product was more than a little eccentric. Being a nature lover, Elise designed the house to allow several inches of bare earth between the walls and living spaces, where she planted large tropical plants that are still alive today. She covered the outside walls with fossils, rocks, crystals, arrowheads, and other objects she'd been collecting since childhood. The house also contains a butterfly wall and a collection of antiques and other unique mementos from the family's lives. Albert passed away in 1972, and Elise passed away 12 years later at the age of 74. Since then, the home has become a popular tourist stop known as Quigley's Castle, where Elise and Albert's grandchildren continue to welcome curious visitors. It's even listed on the National Register of Historic Places. 7. Palazzo Dario Also known as Cardario and the House That Kills, Palazzo Dario is a 500-year-old Gothic palace in Venice, Italy. Legend holds that anyone who owned it or stayed there for more than 20 days either took someone's life, lost their own life, went bankrupt, or experienced some other major life-ruining misfortune. An aristocrat named Giovanni Dario built the home in 1479. After inheriting the property, his daughter, Marietta, drowned in the nearby Grand Canal. Her husband, Vincenzo, and the couple's son, Vincenzo Jr., were murdered. During the 1830s, a British scientist named Radon Brown bought the house from its previous owner, who went bankrupt. Four years later, in 1842, he ran into money problems of his own. Around the same time, people learned of Brown's romantic relationship with another man. At the time, society shunned same-sex couples, and the news erupted into a huge scandal. Brown and his partner were found dead in the mansion from a suspected murder-suicide. Palazzo Dario was uninhabited for the first half of the 20th century. While en route to Venice to sign a contract for their home in 1964, 
world-famous opera singer Mario Del Monaco got into a car accident, causing him to reconsider the purchase. He apparently made the right decision because the house's subsequent owners all experienced misfortune and tragedy. The belief in the Palazzo Dario's curse persists today. Even local fishermen are careful not to cast their lines near it. Some believe that the curse stems from the house being constructed over a cemetery, which causes it to visibly lean to the right. 6. Cuidad Real International Airport Located 120 miles 200 kilometers south of Madrid, the Cuidad Real Central Airport operated for just three years before it closed in 2012. It was Spain's first privately funded airport and was planned and financed during a construction boom that took place during the late 1990s and early 2000s. Cuidad Real finally opened in 2008 after the onset of the global financial crisis that crippled the world economy. International flights to and from Cuidad Real Airport didn't begin until June 2010, and even then, all that was offered was a single Ryanair service between there and London. Just months later, Ryanair's flight service was cancelled. Domestic flights continued until 2012 via other airlines. The airport was meant to accommodate overflow from the airport in Madrid, but was an inconvenient two-hour drive away with no rail service nearby. So, it understandably wasn't very popular, and it wasn't long before the Cuidad Real Airport declared bankruptcy. Some critics speculated that the facility had been built solely to serve the construction industry's interests. Enough loans had been taken out to cover the construction costs, but nobody had invested in the necessary funds to turn the airport into a functioning business, indicating that perhaps nobody cared what happened to it after it was built. Since it's not that old, the property looks perfectly modern, yet is eerily silent, giving it a chilling, post-apocalyptic feel. 5. Winchester Mystery House After her husband's death in 1881, an incredibly wealthy widow named Sarah Winchester started to believe that she was cursed and that relocating was the only way to rid herself of it. So, she packed up and moved across the country, leaving behind her home in New Haven, Connecticut, for an unfinished farmhouse in San Jose, California. Sarah wanted to expand the house, but she didn't want to hire an architect and had no solid plan. The troubled widow nevertheless hired workers and ordered them to build all day and night. Construction continued for 38 years until her death in 1922. During that time, the structure went from being a simple eight-room house to a seven-story, 160-room mansion with 10,000 windows and 2,000 doors. And the additions were, for the most part, completely nonsensical. For example, one door leads directly to a 15-foot, 4.6-meter drop to a garden below, while another door is situated 8 feet, 2.4 meters above a kitchen sink. Some staircases intersect with ceilings rather than the next floor, and there's a series of secret passages including a collection of 30 rooms hidden behind a cabinet door. Some say that Sarah believed she would die if the house was ever finished, and that she created the confusing interior to mislead the malevolent spirits that she believed were after her. The house was declared worthless following her death due to its impractical layout, because it was unfinished, and because it had been damaged in an earthquake. It was open to visitors just months after Sarah died. The Winchester Mansion inspired Stephen King's Rose Red miniseries about a sprawling estate occupied by ill-intending supernatural forces. Would you ever visit the Winchester Mystery House? Tell us if you would or if you have in the comments below and hit that subscribe button while you're at it. 4. The Court of Mysteries In Santa Cruz, California, there's a dirty, dilapidated collection of old buildings that occupy four residential lots. They're surrounded by a strange-looking fence and two towers, along with a gate topped by a mystical-looking silver triangle. Locals have countless nicknames for the home, including the Yogi Temple, the Brick Castle, the Gate of Prophecy, and the Unorthodox Chapel, just to name a few. But the property's official name is the Court of Mysteries, and it sat abandoned for decades. The main house was built during the 1930s by a bricklayer named Kenneth Kitchen, whose architectural designs were inspired by his interest in the occult and Hindu iconography. According to legend, he built almost exclusively at night. His reasons for doing so are unknown, but it's believed that he may have had spiritual reasons, or that he was simply trying to avoid trouble from inspectors and get around the requirement for a building permit. K. 
Kitchen supposedly slept in a yogi shack on the property and never actually lived in the main house, and neither has anyone else. He sold the property sometime during the 1940s or 50s and left the area, and more or less vanished from official records after that. The new owner was a priest whose church transferred him out of state in 1963, and the house was left abandoned for decades. Many locals considered the Court of Mysteries to be an eyesore, and it was even slated for demolition at one point, but was saved by activists who saw historic value in it. It was eventually bought by new owners with the intention of caring for and reviving it as a tourist destination, but it was sold to yet another buyer in late 2021 for $3.9 million. 3. Old Skagen Church Just outside of Skagen, Denmark, there's a 14th century brig church that goes by several names, including the Old Skagen Church, the Buried Church, and the Sand Covered Church. Built between 1355 and 1387, and dedicated to St. Lawrence of Rome, it's one of the area's oldest buildings. It belonged to the Danish crown until 1459, when it became the property of the Hospital of the Holy Ghost, Alborg. At the beginning of the 17th century, the region started to undergo a process known as desertification, which is what it sounds like. In other words, the church's surroundings turned into a desert, and the winds consistently swept sand into the area from nearby Rabjerg Mille. It became a consistent and worsening problem over time, and by the late 18th century, the church's entrance was regularly buried, requiring worshippers to dig their way into the structure whenever they attended a service. The church's contents were removed to protect them from damage, and in 1795, the King of Denmark allowed the facility to close. Most of the structure was either demolished or buried. All that's visible today is the main tower, which sticks out of the sand. The National Museum of Denmark owns the site and maintains the tower as a navigational landmark, but very limited excavations have been carried out on the rest of the building. Authorities believe that the floor, altar, and baptismal font are still there, but have not been investigated. Whether or not they plan to do so remains to be seen. 2. Cartel Cops Parthenon From 1976 to 1982, Arturo El Negro Durazo Moreno served as Mexico City's notoriously corrupt police chief. He made less than $1,000 per month at his day job, but it was clear based on his lavish lifestyle that he had other sources of income. As it turned out, Durazo was an active participant in the region's cocaine trade and also engaged in other nefarious activities, including racketeering and extortion. And he used his privileges as police chief to get his subordinates to carry out much of his dirty work. He used some of his ill-gotten fortune to build a gaudy Greek-themed playhouse that sits on a hilltop overlooking the Pacific Ocean in the coastal city of Zihuantaneo. It was one of the numerous palaces Duranzo built throughout the country. But his fun was short-lived. In 1982, a new president with a staunch anti-corruption agenda was elected. Knowing his dirty deeds would soon catch up with him, Duranzo fled Mexico. A two-year manhunt ensued before he was finally apprehended with the help of the FBI, and he was sentenced to 16 years in prison. In the meantime, the crooked cop's Parthenon-like home fell into a state of neglect. While a caretaker oversees the property today, it's clear that time has taken its toll on the once opulent columns and statues, which are crumbling, broken, dirty, and overgrown. Visitors are allowed to look around in exchange for a small, unofficial entry fee but are warned to use caution and go as a group due to the home's potentially unsafe and hazardous conditions. 1. Presidio Modelo During the 1920s, Cuban dictator Gerardo Machado ordered the construction of a so-called country's second-largest island, known as Isla de la Juventud or Isle of Youth. Located outside the island's capital of Nueva Garona, the complex consists of five circular blocks, with four of the buildings surrounding a central structure. In what's known as Panopticon architectural style, prison cells were built in tiers around central observation posts, enabling guards to keep a constant eye on the facility's inmates and requiring fewer guards altogether. The stations were darkened so that the prisoners couldn't tell if they were being watched. Presidio Modelo was built to house 2,500 men, but became extremely overpopulated as Fidel Castro rose to power, housing more than 6,000 prisoners at one point. There was no running water at the garbage strewn penitentiary, and the Cuban government provided inmates with very little in the way of food and other necessities. 
Castro himself and his brother Raul spent two years at the facility after a failed attack on a military barracks in 1953. The brothers and their co-conspirators were lucky enough to be housed in the prison's hospital wing, where the cells were considered large and luxurious compared to the accommodations in other buildings. But it proved to be a foolish mistake to put all the rebels together, which enabled them to continue with their revolutionary training. They met daily for political lessons and secretly corresponded with supporters of the movement throughout the country. After Castro became dictator in 1959, many of his political opponents were housed at Presidio Modelo. It was during this time that overcrowding and the harsh treatment of inmates became major problems. Riots broke out and prisoners went on hunger strikes and the government closed the facility in 1966. Today, the site is a national monument and a museum and the former administration building functions as a school and research center. 9. Aralcum Desert Ship Graveyard The Aral Sea was once the world's fourth largest inland sea and was home to a thriving fishing industry. During the 1960s, the Soviet Union diverted the rivers feeding the Aral Sea to supply water for cotton and rice fields, causing the sea to dry up leaving behind a poisonous, salty wasteland now known as the Aralkum Desert. Straddling the border of modern-day Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, the Aralkum Desert is littered with rusting fishing boats that were abandoned when the Aral Sea shrunk, and its salt content reached toxic levels, killing all of its marine life. What little is left of the Aral Sea is now just a tenth of its former size, and its fishing industry is a distant memory marked by the decaying trawlers. Much of the ghost fleet lies at the edge of what was once the bustling harbor city of Moynak. The abandoned ships throughout the desert are accompanied by derelict buildings that were part of Moynak and other busy seaside towns years ago. Along with the shrinking of the sea, the surrounding populations have also drastically reduced, and current residents are plagued by health problems from the toxic dust that gets blown around by the wind. There's been a growing effort in recent years to revive the Aral Sea, which is once again being fed by the rivers that were cut off from it. Its salinity has decreased and fish have returned. But there's no knowing whether the sea will be restored to its former glory and submerge the depressing sight of rotting ships. 8. Vogelsang Located deep in the forest of northeastern Germany, the village of Vogelsang has remained hidden from the public eye for the entirety of its existence. It was founded during the 18th century by settlers who felled timber for a living and in 1882, it became part of a state forest. The Soviet military was drawn to Vogelsang's remoteness, leading to the establishment of a nearby base and housing complex in 1951. Just a year later, there were 15,000 people living there, mostly military members and their families. It was the third largest Soviet base in East Germany, consisting of around 550 buildings, including shops, offices, a gym, a school, a theater, and medical facilities. The Soviets managed to keep Vogelsang a complete secret from German civilians and even moved nuclear weapons into the settlement right under the population's nose. They carried out their training exercises at night to avoid being detected. It's unclear how long the Soviets kept nuclear weapons at Vogelsang. Official records state that they were removed in 1959, but American and British military intelligence found that the missiles might have remained there until after the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Russian military abandoned the site in 1994, leaving behind communist-era relics, including an obelisk featuring a carving of Vladimir Lenin and artwork depicting soldiers, military equipment, workers, and farmers. They also left evidence of the seemingly normal residential life the population enjoyed, including liquor bottles and other everyday items, sports equipment, and murals featuring nature scenes, dancers in traditional Russian dress, and cartoon characters. All the buildings at Vogelsang have been demolished, but a few photographers managed to capture pictures and footage of the ruins before they were destroyed. 7. The Bay of Abandoned Hotels There's a collection of five derelict, overgrown hotels along the Adriatic shoreline, near the Croatian seaside town of Kupari, that have all clearly seen better days. Built during the 1960s, when the region was part of Yugoslavia, they're now known as the Bay of Abandoned Hotels. Altogether, the upscale hotels could accommodate up to 1,600 people, and there was a nearby campground with room for up to 4,000 people, along with numerous private villas. 
The resort was built largely with military funding, and as it became more popular, it got increasingly difficult for ordinary middle-class people to book a room. As a result, the hotels and their surrounding accommodations became known as a place exclusively for the military elite. After Croatia declared its independence from Yugoslavia in 1991, a war ensued, and Croatian soldiers took up residence at the hotels. Over a several-week period, the Yugoslavs destroyed the very resort that they had created, looting and burning the hotels in an effort to oust the Croatians. The war ended in 1995 with a Croatian victory, but the region is still littered with signs of the devastating violence today. Once bustling properties have been left to decay, but the area has seen an increased number of visitors in recent years, and the deteriorating hotels are catching the attention of investors, indicating that perhaps the property will be revived sometime in the near future. 6. Calico Located in San Bernardino County in Southern California, Calico was founded as a silver mining town in 1881 in the Calico Mountains of the Mojave Desert. In the mid-1880s, it became the epicenter of California's silver industry. It all started when a group of prospectors discovered silver in the area, which was quickly followed by the construction of a post office, three hotels, five general stores, and numerous bars and brothels. The county also established a school district, along with several boarding houses, restaurants, and other businesses. Town officials were also appointed, including two constables, a justice of the peace, five commissioners, and two doctors. By 1885, Calico's population had grown to around 1,200 residents, and there were at least 500 nearby mines. There were also telephone and telegraph services, including a Wells Fargo offices, which was often seen as a symbol of the so-called American dream. Calico's population peaked at around 3,500 residents in 1890, with Chinese, English, Irish, Greek, French, and Dutch nationals all living within the town, along with Americans. But the town's glory days came to an abrupt end in 1896, when the value of silver diminished rapidly, causing local mines to shut down en masse. The post office closed the following year, and by the turn of the century, Calico was a ghost town, and it remains one to this day. It's a sad but not uncommon story in the American chapter of westward expansion, and any attempts to revive the town as anything other than a tourist attraction have, predictably, failed. Have you ever been to an abandoned ghost town? Tell us about your experience in the comments below, and hit subscribe while you're at it. 5. Chaiten In 2008, the Chaiten volcano in Chilean Patagonia erupted violently after sitting dormant for over 9,000 years. Hurling ash to an altitude of more than 10 miles, it was the first rhyolitic eruption to be observed in modern times. Rhyolitic eruptions are highly explosive, causing magma to spew catastrophically toward the sky and all over the surrounding environs. Volcanic ash rained down on the town of Shaiten six miles away, while mudflows caused the banks of the nearby Blanco River to burst, turning one of the town's streets into a new channel. Around 5,000 residents were evacuated as buildings were buried in up to five feet of sediment. In the meantime, the nearby airport and marine facilities sustained extensive damage. Today, Shaiden remains deserted and uninhabitable, and its former residents are hesitant to return anyway because they're worried that history might repeat itself. They reported that earthquakes had gotten stronger and more frequent in the days leading up to the eruption, but authorities had failed to realize that the tremors were a sign of impending volcanic doom, leaving them at the mercy of Mother Nature. Even the Chilean Geological Survey, Cerna Geomin, considered the volcano a non-threat and weren't monitoring it prior to the eruption and the settlers who founded Chaiten in 1940 were also unaware of the nearby danger. In response to the eruption, the Chilean government relocated the former residents of Chaiten and began working closely with scientists to develop a nationwide plan for addressing volcanic hazards. But the village itself remains partially buried and frozen in time. 4. Wunsdorf Nicknamed Little Moscow and the Forbidden City, Wunsdorf is a 60,000-acre former East German military camp that once served as the Red Army's German headquarters, housing 75,000 German men, women, and children, including 40,000 soldiers. Life there was strict. Soldiers weren't allowed to take vacations or have their loved ones visit, according to tour guide Werner Borschert, who spoke with CNN. But there were some perks, including privacy. Situated deep in the forest, roughly 25 miles south of Berlin, 
Wunsdorf functioned as a hidden community with schools, shops, a concert hall, and even a pool, theater, and other luxurious accommodations that were reserved for more high-ranking military members and their families. The last remaining Russian soldiers fled the complex in 1994, a few years after the Iron Curtain fell. They received just 12 hours' notice and left in a hurry, with some even abandoning their half-eaten lunches and leaving their pets behind. Some of the buildings remain seemingly untouched, under the care of a lone groundsman who works hard to keep them in good condition, although the elements have taken an undeniable toll. Two statues of Vladimir Lenin sit outside, and the structures remain filled with Cold War-era artwork. Other buildings have been repurposed, including the former soldiers' barracks, which were converted into residential apartments. Wunsdorf is one of the few out of the many abandoned former Soviet sites throughout Germany that's open to the public, giving visitors an opportunity to peer back to a time that feels like it happened much longer ago than it actually did. 3. Alima Island from 1912 to 1943, Italy's fascist regime, known as the Kingdom of Italy, occupied the Greek Dodecanese Islands. Its navy, the Regia Marina, used Alima Island as a military outpost and a submarine base. During World War II, the Nazis began to question Italy's loyalty as an Axis power. To be safe, the Germans decided that they wanted Alima and its surrounding islands to themselves. In what became known as the Battle of Leros, German forces took thousands of Italians as prisoners, executing many of them on the spot. The Nazis were quick to make themselves at home in the Dodecanese Islands, including at the base on Alamo. The following year, seven British commandos attacked the harbor in an attempt to destroy German submarines there. They were quickly captured, and six of the seven British men were executed. Meanwhile, many citizens were deported from Alamo for trying to help the commandos. The last remaining family on Alima eventually left to seek better opportunities, and nobody's lived there since the 60s. In 1987, the deserted village was declared a protected settlement. The military buildings still stand, and some are riddled with bullet holes, serving as an eerie reminder of a dark chapter in recent world history. Other structures lie in ruins, with old furniture scattered throughout. World War II relics are strewn across the island. Graffiti left behind by German soldiers shows men drinking beer and receiving letters, landscapes from their homeland, and other scenes that might remind a man of his life before the war. 2. Varosha Decades ago, during a time that's long since passed, the rich and famous flocked to a resort town on the island of Cyprus known as Varosha. Located within the city of Famagusta, it was one of the world's most popular tourist destinations during the early 1970s, attracting the likes of Elizabeth Taylor and Brigitte Bardot. Turkish forces invaded Cyprus and took control of Famagusta in 1974, causing Varosha's 39,000 inhabitants to flee. They left with plans to eventually return, but unfortunately, that never happened. Ever since, the site has remained abandoned and fenced off. The city is off limits to the public, and nature's reclaimed most of it. Only Turkish military and United Nations UN personnel are allowed there. Urban explorers have occasionally snuck in and snapped photos of Varosha's crumbling buildings, rusting cars, shops with clothing on the racks, and tables still set for the next meal, which serve as an eerie time capsule depicting the rush state in which people left. As of 2020, authorities in northern Cyprus were reportedly entertaining the idea of reopening Varosha but nothing has happened yet. 1. Bechevinka During the 1960s, a top-secret submarine base and military town called Bechevinka was established on Russia's Kamchatka Peninsula in the country's Far East. The residential section consisted of eight three- to five-story apartment buildings, a kindergarten and school, a hostel, post office, grocery store, and a club for entertainment. All the necessary installations, including barracks, storage facilities, a commandant's office, a headquarters building, boiler room, diesel substation, and a fuel warehouse could be found on the military portion of the property. A supply ship stopped at Bechevinka once a week to drop off food, mail, and necessities. It was the remote settlement's main connection to the outside world, as there was no land route between Bechevinka and other cities, and the only way to reach it was by boat or helicopter. The base closed down in 1996, five years after the Soviet Union's collapse, as a cost-saving measure. Residents simply packed up and moved elsewhere, leaving behind a ghost town that looks pretty much the same now as how it was left, minus the effects of time and the elements. 
Because it's remote and difficult to access, the ruins have been largely spared from vandalism. What's left there today consists of rusting ships and derelict buildings filled with personal belongings and other items, including toys, newspapers, equipment manuals, textbooks, children's drawings, and furniture. Thanks for watching. Which of these abandoned towns would you like to visit? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe. See you next time. Bye.